So with only three main genus to discuss, there should be relatively little confusion with the presentations and the related diseases in this tier. For treponema, name the term and the stage of disease associated with the presentation. What would you call a soft skin granuloma that develops on a syphilitic patient? These are known as gumas and typically define the tertiary stage of syphilis. These are not the genital ulcers that are usually associated with the first stage presentations, but can occur anywhere on the body. Unlike the skin rash of syphilis, these are necrotic and ulcerative in appearance. What about facial abnormalities generally associated with the eyes, teeth, and nose? This best describes uveitis or keratitis of the eye, Hutchinson teeth, and saddle nose deformity that can be seen in newborns of infected mothers. Usually the placenta acts as a protective barrier for a fetus, but some pathogens and pharmaceuticals can get past it. Next we see a painless lesion typically seen in the genital or perianal region. This is the chancre that is pathognomonic for primary syphilis. These lesions may be similar to the chancroid in appearance. Lastly, what is a term for the process leading to skin lesions in the hands and feet? Inflamed arteries should give this away. This is a form of endarteritis. It seems to be due to an inflammation of superficial blood vessels, leading to the characteristic rash. With Borrelia, there are only a few obvious presenting signs and symptoms, but also a few that are easily missed by medical students or confused with other diseases by physicians. Here are a few you should definitely be aware of. For generic patient number one, they present with an early stage rash. If you couldn't guess, it is shaped like a target or bullseye. What is the technical name of this rash? There are many skin rashes with a variety of similar sounding names. Erythema migrans is the one associated with B. bungdorferi. Lyme disease is the only bug you should ever associate with this rash on an exam. In the clinic, however, there is an exception to every rule. Next, we see a patient that had pain that was in her left shoulder last week and now complains that it is in her left knee and right elbow. What is this associated condition called? Migratory arthralgia, or migrating joint pain, can be easily confused with multi-joint pain syndromes. Being very deliberate with patient-oriented questions is the best way to separate these two presentations and narrow the scope of your differential diagnosis. In the same room, patient number two's brother displays a unilateral lowered eyelid and has complained to a sister in the room that his muscle sprain from a few weeks ago is still lingering. Being an observance physician, you put two and two together and question them both about being in the woods recently. They admit to a family camping trip a few weeks earlier. What is this lid lag or ptosis describing? Facial palsy is a rare presentation for infectious causes and is more commonly associated in viral etiologies. But Lyme disease is one of the few bacterial causes of this neurologic deficit. A very weak and frail-looking elderly patient comes to your clinic complaining that he woke up on the floor and isn't sure how he got there. His head began to hurt before the fall, and he is now very light sensitive. If we had a positive lab culture for leptospira, what is the possible cause? This form of leptospirosis was previously known as wheel syndrome. Though the eponym name is usually unnecessary, be wary of vague symptoms with the possible history of seizure. Any test question would need to give you a significant amount of information to lead towards this instead of other options, but in the clinic, lepto and other less common diseases can easily go undiagnosed. And our last patient for this module presents with several weeks of flu-like symptoms. The patient has a history of recent travel, so on a hunch you run serologies for a few rare bugs. Leptospira comes back positive. What is the name of the more common presentation? Swamp fever, or pseudodengue, can present with severe myalgia that lasts for several weeks. Though rare, there would be a concern for meningitis or renal disease if not treated. Now, let's go over the three cases described in the previous tier and see if your answers match up. To recap, case one was Mr. Druzin, the 26-year-old male that came to the emergency room because his arm was swollen and he has a history of injection drug use. So, how did you go about this patient's presentation? From the first complaint, we know that the patient's arm is bothering him, and we don't know why. We could easily consider a broken bone, but he doesn't mention any recent trauma. He does give us the clue of intravenous drug use that greatly limits what is on the top of our list for diseases. If we are now thinking of an infective cause, what type of testing might be useful? 
We have several bacteria that frequently cause skin infections, but Streptococcus and Staphylococcus are by far the most common. Since we don't have a simple and localized rash, cellulitis is likely the main pathology here. What did you list for potential future consequences? If you recall, there was a common theme in the first module of many bacteria causing endocarditis. Infective endocarditis can be a persistent disease requiring weeks of antibiotics. Cellulitis can also progress locally to become an abscess. These are just some of the concerns of where this disease untreated might go to. For case number two, we had Mr. Wiley, the 67-year-old male. Remember, he had the persistent cough and fever and was recently traveling. For our elderly gentlemen with a persistent cough, what are some of the possible causes? Of course, we have a lot of respiratory pathogens to consider. Luckily, he is a non-smoker and never mentioned anything about coughing up blood, which makes some of the other diseases much less likely. The duration of the mild fever may also be a pretty good clue. For any respiratory disease, often a chest x-ray is the first line to see if any disease process can be visualized. It's also fast and cheap, so this is the first line of diagnosis in a hospital. As we don't have an x-ray in our clinic, we might have to consider sending them out for one. While in the office, we also take vitals, which come back normal except for the mild fever. Let's also send him out for some blood work and check his current immune reactivity and cell count. We'll check back with Mr. Riley when he completes his lab work. A low and persistent fever is more commonly a viral illness. For those, and since it's not in any acute distress, it may be best not to prescribe antibiotics just yet. In the third case, we have Miss Hall, the 32-year-old female with urinary frequency. With Miss Hall, we have likely already greatly limited the options quite a bit. The presentation and gender do not leave a lot of room for speculation, unless we are looking for zebras. We may write this off as a simple UTI, or decide to investigate further. In the office, the patient seems impatient and requests a script so she can get to a meeting. What script do you decide on for the treatment of the seemingly uncomplicated UTI? For a non-pregnant patient, the usual course would be ciprofloxacin or trimethsulfa. We tell her to let us know if there's no change in 24 to 48 hours, and she vanishes out the door. Job well done. Or is it? In the next tier, we'll revisit these case studies with added complexity. Needless to say, we might have jumped to a few conclusions. Even when following the correct diagnosis and treatment algorithms, some patients leave out vital information or present in atypical ways. Make sure you understand the material that has been covered so far and see you in the next tier.